Before you hit buy on that rare comic book, watch this. I'll break down what rarity is, what makes a comic rare, and how it affects its value on the market. According to Webster, rare means seldom occurring or found, uncommon. For comic books, rarity can mean different things depending on who you ask. Two big names in the comic world, Ernie Gerber and Bob Overstreet, have their own takes on this. In the photo journal guide to comic books, here's how prevalence was categorized. We'll zoom in to Gerber 6 through 11. 6 uncommon, 50 to 200. 7 scarce, 21 to 50. At 8, we're finally getting into rare. 11 to 20 copies estimated to exist. 9 is very rare, 6 to 10. 10 is unique, which is less than 5. And 11, non existent, but known to be published. By the way, help a brother out. I'm hoping to get a Gerber 5 number of likes on this video. Please help me get less than average. Let's go to the Overstreet price guide and see what Bob Overstreet has to say. He defines three terms, scarce, 20 to 100 copies, rare, 10 to 20 copies, and very rare, 1 to 10 copies. As you can see, he and Gerber are, for the most part, on the same page. To me, there's a bit of a problem though. According to these standards, many comics that are often called ultra rare in mainstream media like Action Comics number one and Detective Comics number 27 don't quite make the cut they each have about 100 copies in existence, which is more than the rare thresholds set by Overstreet and Gerber. Personally, I'm a little looser with my definition. For instance, I have no problem with saying an issue is rare if 200 or fewer are believed to exist. This means that Marvel Comics number one, Action One, Tech 27, all neatly fall into the rarity category. Now let's break down the different types of rarity. Absolute rarity, this is based on the number of copies believed to exist. And the guidance you just saw from Gerber and Overstreet is an example of this category. Moving to relative rarity, which is about comparing one thing to another. For example, I can say Golden Age comics are harder to find than Silver Age comics. As you can see, many Golden Age comics like Action 1 are much rarer than Silver Age keys. Even Showcase Comics 4, which is more common than Golden Age books, is still rare compared to most Silver Age comics. Notice how older comics seem to be rare and that I'm using CGC census numbers to get a rough idea of how many copies are out there. We'll talk more about these topics and X-Men number one later. But first, let's explore other ways that people use the term rare. Conditional rarity. Sometimes a comic might not be rare overall, but it can be exceptionally rare in top condition. That's called conditional rarity. For example, Fantastic Four number one likely has three or 4,000 copies in existence, but only a few are in really exceptional shape. Only three have been graded in 9.2, three in 9.4, and two in 9.6 by CGC. So it's rare to find a Fantastic Four number one in near mint minus or better. It's not just old comics that can be conditionally rare. Even newer ones can be rare if they're in nosebleed gray. Take Spider-Man number 300, which is the first appearance of Venom, as an example. There may be 100,000 plus copies in existence, and even 9.8s are easy to find. But at a 9.9 .9 or 10, watch out, the book all of a sudden becomes super tough to acquire. Attribute rarity. Sometimes a comic book can be rare because of something special about it, not just because it's old or in great condition. It's like having a comic book with something extra, like an unusual set of signatures or a variant cover. Even mistakes can make a comic rare. For example, Venom number one is typically common, but if it has a white cover and printing error instead of the regular one, it is legitimately rare. Market availability rarely. Market availability rarity. Boy, that uh, really rolls off the tongue there, Keston. Is basically how easy it is to find a book on sale. With the internet, it's gotten much easier to track down comics that were once hard to find. Nevertheless, market availability is still highly correlated with absolute rarity. For example, you'll see X-Men number one pop up for sale more often than Showcase 4, and Showcase 4 is much easier to find than Action Comics number one. Two main factors make a comic book rare. How many were printed and how many were lost. The number of copies made is called the print run. And the number of destroyed or thrown away is called attrition. A comic can be rare because it was part of a tiny print run or because most of them disappeared over the years or a combination of both. For example, according to Heritage Auctions, Gobbledygook number one is rare because Mirage Studios only photocopied 50. The story of Marvel Comics number one is dramatically different. The initial print runs totaled almost a million, but today perhaps only a hundred exist. In other words, for every 10,000 copies of Marvel 1 printed, only one survived. Let that sink in for a moment. That's devastating attrition. Why are old comics rare? 
What in the world happened to once prevalent books like Marvel 1? It all boils down to how people viewed comics from the 30s through the 50s. Comics were disposable. Kids would buy them, read them, then goodbye. They'd be tossed in the trash. And it wasn't just ordinary house cleaning. It had also been consumed by paper drives during World War II or burned to a crisp in an old-fashioned bonfire. Somebody had to get rid of this material that was corrupt in the youth. Thankfully, the attitude toward comics began to change in the 60s. It was a time of experimentation. Drugs, sex, rock and roll, and thinking comics might be valuable one day. And that's when comic collectors started trickling onto the scene. People began looking for and saving older comics. This had two big effects. First, more comics survived because people weren't throwing them away as often. Second, collectors began handling comics with care, not rolling them up and shoving them in their back pockets. By the 90s, the mindset had changed dramatically. Comics weren't disposable items. They were hot commodities. Publishers hyped new books and added fancy 3D and foil covers. Speculators bought new books by the dozens, hoping they'd be worth a fortune someday. Remember X-Men number one from 1991? Comparatively, it makes X-Men number one from 1963 seem like Honus Wagner cards. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, it holds the record for the highest print run of over 8 million. I would guess most copies weren't read. Collectors were worried about getting fingerprints on their future treasure. So how do modern books become rare? A modern comic book needs to be born rare by being part of a tiny print run. Sometimes this happens accidentally. Like with Mirage Studios' Gobbledygook No. 1. They just didn't have much money, so they printed 50 the only way they could via photocopy. But other times, publishers create or created rarity on purpose. They do this with variant covers, special editions printed in much smaller quantities than the regular issue. For example, Amazing Spider-Man 667, the Del Auto variant cover, is on the cusp of being rare. Perhaps 200 copies exist, according to Recalled Comics. Most modern books that people think are valuable are the ones that are variants. These 1 in 25, 1 in 50, 1 in 100 variant covers. Something that many of you all have been thinking about but I haven't addressed yet is what is this relationship between rarity and the value of a comic? To previous videos that I've done, some people have commented that rarity doesn't matter when it comes to comic book prices. They say it's all about demand. But is that really true? Some people think just because some rare comic books aren't worth much money that there's no relationship between rarity and value. But that's not quite right. It's like saying height doesn't matter in basketball because there are some short players in the NBA. Sure, there are some exceptions, but most of the time being tall is a big advantage. A seven footer with a little talent has a good shot of making the NBA. If you're under six feet tall, You'll need to have one in a million talent to have a shot. The same thing happens with comics. A rare comic with even a little bit of interest can see its price go up. But a common comic needs a crazy amount of hype to become valuable. For example, Spawn 1 is extremely common in a 9.8, but it sells for over $100 because of the widespread demand. To really see the impact of rarity, let's compare four uber popular books that differ based on prevalence. The relationship is clear. Check out Action 1. In median grade, which is about a 4.0, that book sells for about $2 million. That's compared to Amazing Fantasy 15, which is an exceptionally valuable book. Its median grade is about a 3.5, and that sells for just a little over 30000 in that grade. Once you move to Hulk 181, then the values go down from there because there are so many copies that exist in these other books. But it's not just about how rare a comic book is overall or absolute rarity. The condition is also important. Going back to conditional rarity, 9.8s are common for Spawn 1 and New Mutants 98. But if you go up to a 9.9 .9 or higher, they become very hard to find. Notably, these books get much more expensive in the nosebleed grades. Similarly, a 9.6 Amazing Fantasy 15 sold for $3.6 million a couple of years back, even though, as we talked about, the median copy sells for only a hair over 30 grand. With this information, you might be asking, how do I know if my comic is rare, or just what is the prevalence of my comic? Truth is, it's tough to say for most comics. Several people have estimated how many copies exist for particular books. For example, the Gerbers estimated that Amazing Fantasy had average scarcity with 1,000 to 2,000 copies. But these estimates are usually too low. We now understand that there's thousands of more comics out there of Amazing Fantasy 15. Today we have a better tool, although not perfect, it's the CGC Census. 
This tracks comics that have been graded by the company. While it's great for high value books, it doesn't tell the whole story for less valuable ones. In other words, there's a lot of books that just aren't valuable enough to get graded. So seeing only a few copies on the census doesn't mean it's rare if the book isn't worth much. For really valuable books, the CGC census can be incredibly helpful. In an interview I had with Matt Nelson, he implied that CGC has graded a high percentage of extremely valuable books. Specifically, he said about half of the Hulk 181s have been graded, and Hulk 181 is about the lower limit of really valuable books we're talking about. And he thought that about 75 or 80 percent of Action 1s have been graded. So 81 have been graded, and he believes that there's about 100 overall that exist. Based on this idea that, you know, 50 to 80 percent of really valuable books have been graded, we can guess how many comics exist for other extremely valuable books. By the way, you can check out that conversation with Matt in the description box. There's that and many other videos that I've created on Rarity, plus an article that I wrote about Rarity. But let's get back to Matt. He also said comics printed before and during World War II likely have 50 to 100 copies left in existence. Notable exceptions include Batman 1, Superman 1, and Captain America Comics Number 1 that have multiple hundreds surviving. He also brought up a strategy to estimate prevalence benchmarking. That is, if you were to look at a Hulk 180, 181, 182, 183, Hulk 181 has the highest CGC numbers. Not because Hulk 181 is likely more prevalent, it's because it's a more valuable book and the CGC census is likely more representative. The idea here is that if you wanted to calculate the prevalence of a particular book and it's around a key, use the key census information as your benchmark. For newer comics, 1980s and beyond, the CGC census just isn't that helpful. Most of these books aren't worth enough to get graded, at least below the really high grades. Instead, investigate what the initial print run was. This can give a better idea of how many might still be around. Keep in mind, not all printed comics actually sold. A website called Comicron has this info for some comics from the 1960s forward. Let's come back to X-Men number one from 1963, because I think it tells us an important lesson about rarity. First, for everybody out there who's thinking I'm hating on the book, I'm not, I love X-Men number one. In the past, I owned two different copies, and I'd be happy to have another one in my collection. What bugs the hell out of me, though, is that there's so much misinformation about Rarity, especially about X-Men number one. If you do a Google search on the rarest comic books, I'll be damned if X-Men number one doesn't pop up on a lot of the first websites that you see. And if you go into ChatGPT, there again, it lists X-Men number one if you're asking for the 10 rarest books. Look at that definition that ChatGPT gives. It's confounding a lot of pieces with rarity, talking about its uh, value and first appearances and this and that. It's like, no, let's clear that. When I think about rarity, the first thing I think about is absolute rarity. How many copies exist? And then if I'm talking about price, then I'll bring in some of those other factors. Does it have historical significance? Is it a first appearance? How easy or hard it is to find on the market? They are important to price, but not to rarity. If somebody asks me, Keston, is X-Men number one from 1963 rare? Here's what my best response would be. In absolute terms, it's not even close to being rare. Even if you thought a thousand copies existing was your threshold for rare, which would be super loose, it's way over that. There's over 6,000 on CGC census, and there's likely several thousand more that are out there. My guess is there's probably 10,000 copies of X-Men number one that exist. Relatively speaking, it's common compared to Golden Age books. On the other hand, if you're comparing X-Men number one to Bronze Age keys like Hulk 181 or ASM 129 or more modern books like ASM 300, the next X-Men 1 is pretty hard to find. So regarding conditional rarity, now if you do go up high enough in grade, X-Men number 1 gets really hard to find. 9.0 or higher, it's tough, but then when you go up to a 9.6 or higher, it is extremely rare. Did you know that there's an X-Men number 1 UK price variant? Check out the pence, only about 130 on census. These copies have attributional rarity. Keep in mind, copies that have attributional rarity aren't always more expensive. When you put the typical US copy versus the UK copy of X-Men number one, the US copy sells for more in the same grade. So in this case, there's more demand for the US copy despite the US copy being way more prevalent. How about market availability rarity for X-Men number one? Well, yeah, not so much. You can go just about anywhere on the internet. Um, eBay, you can go to any of the auction sites. And almost all the time, you'll see several copies of X-Men 
one available. So it's not hard to find at all. Let's go back to the question, what is rare in the absolute sense? That's still a really tricky question. Some of the big experts like Overstreet and Gerber had their opinions. Personally, I think they're too strict, but I do agree for absolute rarity, the books before and during World War II, they're really tough. For most of them, I would consider them rare. But relax everybody, rarity isn't everything. If you love a comic, get it, even if it's common. But if you're thinking about comic books as an investment, be careful about when somebody says a comic is rare. Do your research to see if it's actually hard to find. Oh, by the way, are you interested in seeing actual rare comic book grails? Then check out this video. And by God, X-Men number one is not on my list. You can count on Keston's old school comic books not to use ChatGPT as my reference material. Thanks so much for watching, my friends. If you like the content, consider subscribing. And I hope to see you around real soon.